I would like to invite Professor H. R. Krishnamurti, for Department Chairman of Physics, to chair the session. Okay. Uh, yeah, welcome to the session. So the first talk, actually both uh, talks are being given by my very distinguished colleagues. So the first talk will be given by Vijay Shanoi, fermions in synthetic non-abelian gauge fields. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, Arindam and uh, Krishnendu for giving me this very nice opportunity to present the work. Uh, that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm of course a local boy. My office is uh, just a stone's throw away. But I suggest that you use these soft uh, links to get in touch with me, not the stone. Okay, so, so let me start by thanking people who have helped me over the years and also uh, funding agencies, uh, DST and DAE. Uh, Krish, the chairman, and uh, my uh, esteemed friend who are, from whom I've learned a lot of physics. It's not working? Yeah, there's a green light. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and the key contributors to everything that I'm going to say, uh, the main contributor is this young man, Jayant Vyasnakara. I don't know if he's here. He's sitting right at the end. And Sudip Ghosh. And uh, uh, they're wonderful people. Okay. So what is standing between uh, you and Ajay Sood is this stuff. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about the background because we have not seen much of cold atoms in this uh, conference yet, uh, although Steve did mention about quantum emulation and so on. Uh, and I'll, I'll, my, the main topic of what I'm going to be discussing is this, pro, is this subject of interacting fermions in synthetic gauge fields. So I'll first raise a question, and then I'll sh tell you what the answer or answers, and then I'll tell you what it's all good for. And all the stuff that I'm going to be telling you, you can find in these papers. And shortly after our paper appeared, there have been many more papers in this area. And I will not be able to uh, sort of give you a summary of all of that. And finally, I'll conclude with a commercial on other projects that are going on in our uh, group, which are also related to the uh, subject of this meeting. So let me first apologize to Mayorana, and in particular, uh, Jay, etc., who have worked on similar problems uh, focusing on the Majorana fermion. I will not be able to have, I don't, will not have the time to discuss all your resources. Okay, so background. So let's see, what are the big questions in condensed matter physics now? So this is a plot of year versus temperature of uh, uh, superconductors. So you can see that we have reached uh, superconducting transient temperatures, which are like the nighttime temperatures of the moon, which is good for Newt Gingrich, because he knows a little bit about pressure as well. So he can generate them when he sets up his colony in, on the moon, but we don't have it on the Earth. Okay. So what are the difficulties here? There are three issues. There are experimental difficulties, creating clean samples. There are theoretical difficulties. There's no small parameter. And finally, of course, there are difficult theorists. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is a conversation that I heard, overheard after people in the, in the corridor, uh, after people heard... Uh, uh, Addy's and uh, Steve's lectures on quantum computing. So even with the 2000 node cluster, now our students seem to not want to do any computing because they're waiting for the quantum computer because they think it'll all be they think it'll all be very easy to do. Okay. So how do we make an ambient uh, condition quantum computer? So let's say that these are some very big questions. So uh, as I said, there are various difficulties, and one way to actually address some of these difficulties is to try to create systems where the Hamiltonian is sort of designed by you. And you also try to, uh, uh, in parallel, build a theory for what you're going to see. So the idea is you create a system in which the uh, particles are atoms, such as a bosonic rubidium or fermionic lithium. You trap them and cool them, and you create a, uh, some problem where you're going to address a problem in the continuum or on the lattice. You control the interaction between the particles, such as tuning the scattering link between them, and then you do a measurement. So these are quantum emulators, and these have seen quite remarkable success in the last few years. So this is the famed uh, phase diagram of the Bose-Hubbard model. And this is in a trap, and this has now actually been re realized in Harvard, and I'm, I'm actually showing you uh, pictures from uh, uh, Greiner's group here. So fantastic uh, progress in this uh, field. So is, it, is that the end of all, or are there difficulties? What are the issues now? So there is there's a very key difficulty as far as quantum emulation with cold atoms is concerned. That is, realizing the quantum regime 
uh, in the strongly interacting, when the particles are strongly interacting. Then there's, of course, the problem of the trap. It's not clear that this is a good thing or a bad thing. It can be used to get some information out, but it can also spoil things. Then there's the question of measurement and inference. Suppose you create a Majorana fermion. How do you know that you have created a Majorana fermion, for example, in the cold atoms? And then, of course, if you want to simulate all the exotic phases that we have been hearing about in the last two, three days, we need some electromagnetic fields. We need the atoms to talk to electromagnetic fields. But the atoms are neutral, and there is a problem. And that is where the synthetic gauge fields come in. So let me tell you what are the what are the problems we could possibly address if we had synthetic gauge fields. So if you look at all of these problems that are very current in the uh, modern condensed matter research, you will see that all of them need some kind of magnetic field, spin orbit coupling, something of that nature. Okay. So you could try to do this in cold atoms by doing rotations and so on, but then you have to be really fine tuned, and still it's very hard to get into any kind of quantum Hall regime, for example. Okay, so the idea then is to generate synthetic gauge fields. What does that mean? You, you cheat the atom to believe that it is seeing a magnetic field. So actually, the synthetic potential was actually what taught us about spin. For example, the stern galdrak experiment is actually a synthetic potential that was created on the atoms. And so the idea is you apply some time-varying electromagnetic fields, and the atoms will reorganize their states in some way, and you move in the adiabatic mon manifold of those states, and in that manifold, you will see some kind of gauge field. This is the idea. Okay, so has this been successful? Absolutely, and this is absolutely fantastic experiments from uh, Ian Spielman's group. And so, what they have done is they have generated a U1 gauge field. I'm not going to go into the details of this. And what they've been able to do is that they have been able to actually uh, take a, a rubidium BC and actually inject vortices into it by changing a, a, a detuning parameter, for example. It's a quite remarkable uh, achievement. Okay, all right. So this is a U1 gauge field. It's an abelian gauge field. Can we generate non-abelian gauge fields? Yes, there have been many proposals for it. Yes. Yes, yes. It's uh, it's this. So what they have done is an implementation of the Landau gauge. Oh, so it's, there are several things uh, I can discuss with you more in detail later, but. Uh, yeah, so it's like a detuning, uh, the, the, the amount of detuning gradient that you put in and so on. There are limits. I mean, it's, it's not infinite, but yeah. Okay, so, so there are also proposals for generating non-abelian gauge fields, and uh, there, there have been many of them, actually. And uh, what can we do with non-abelian gauge fields? The most important and interesting thing is that even a spatially uniform non-abelian gauge field can give you new interesting physics. Whereas a uniform U1 gauge field is simply some kind of Galilean transformation, right? So this is the point. And actually, Jason Ho and his postdoc, and also uh, Hui Zai uh, were the, some of the first people to investigate this. And what they found was that if, if you have a non-abelian gauge field for bosons, you can actually condense into some density wave-like states. And these are the pictures of that. And actually, this sort of physics, this kind of phase diagram which, was, which I put up, has sort of roughly been also reproduced by Ian Spielman's group. Uh, in the in the bosonic uh, 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 setting, so the natural question that came up at the end of 2010 is, what happens with fermions? Okay, and how do we generate non-abelian gauge fields? Is the first question that uh, I will address, and then I will come back to the question of fermions. Okay, so here is a schematic way of generating non-abelian gauge fields. So what we call uh, what is called in this literature is, is called as the n-pod scheme. So what you do is you take an atom with n plus one states. You pick a particular state which you like, called zero, and then you you rub a couple them to all these other n states. And when you do this, this will actually break up into quasi energies of this structure. One can actually show this. And this manifold is called as a dark state manifold, and there are m of them, and this m is equal to n minus one. Okay, so you get this manifold. Now the most important thing to notice is that this manifold is spatially dependent, right? That's because these Rabi couplings are position dependent. So if I look at space, there is, a set, there is a set of dark states here which span the Hilbert space here. There is another set of dark states here which span the same Hilbert space, if you like, but they're sort of rotated. And these two are related to each other by a, a unitary transformation. Okay? So this set of states here are related to those set of states by a unitary transformation which belongs to SUM. So, Matters can be arranged in such a way that the most important term in this 
is u time u uh, in u of r is exponential of a times r where r is the position vector and a now has to be some element of the lie algebra it has to be a linear combination of the generators for every direction that is x y and z you need one element of the lie algebra okay so what do i have i have these ai's which are the elements of lie algebra and i expand them in the basis in the lie uh, algebra basis j mu are the generators and then what happens is as the particle moves in this manifold it sees a, it there's an induced connection or gauge field and that is what is written here and this was actually shown by various people uh, before that and what happens is that the mechanical momentum of the system gets replay from the original mechanical momentum to this object which is p minus a which is now a matrix that's the gauge field right? that's the non abelian gauge field so this stuff is excellent for things like nature physics but not very good for laboratory physics because of <laughs> because of this problem that you see you have a dark state manifold and there's a there's a low lying state any coupling between this will simply destroy your gas so there are other schemes that are slightly harder to explain so i'm using this as a illustrative example okay now let me go to the question what what is the question we are asking to raise the question i need to also give you some more background that is the problem of interacting fermions in three dimensional continuum without any gauge field and this is the famous bcs bc crossover so let's take two spin half fermions which are uh, talking to each other by some attractive interaction we know that in three dimensions if i want to have a bound state between these fermions i need some critical strength of the attraction an arbitrarily weak attraction cannot form a bound state of two free fermions in three dimensions okay and this thing is very nicely captured by this uh, uh, this uh, rg picture v is the strength of the interaction in some dimensionless units there are two fixed points the free fixed point and the resonant fixed point and the at the free so if uh, if the attractive interaction is small then all the physics is uh, is uh, determined by the free fixed point it's like free particles with some little bit of scattering phase shift or some sort whereas if you are here the ground state is actually a bound state of these two fermions that's what this picture is telling you okay what happens if i have finite density of fermions this is a very famous problem uh, worked on by various people uh, and what actually happens is that for a small negative scattering length which is weak attractive interaction i get a bcs like state with a small exponentially small transition temperature whose chemical potential at zero temperature is essentially unchanged from the fermi energy on the other hand if i increase the strength of the attractive interaction to make it make the scattering length positive and small then i go to a bec state where i form tightly bound molecules of these fermions and they both condense and here the chemical potential is determined by the binding energy of these two fermions okay that's what actually happens okay and this uh, entire game has been spectacularly realized in cold atoms and what you can actually see is that the tc experimentally realized is 0.18 tf and i think this is the world record for tc by tf i don't think we we uh, at least terrestrially i don't know if any other system which has tc by tf of 0.18 imagine if you could do this in 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 aluminum or something okay uh tc of 0.18 is somewhere around here this is a this is a gaussian fluctuation calculation if you put in more stuff you can actually bring it down okay it's near the resonance point it's near where the scattering length goes to infinity okay so now let me put uh, the non abelian gauge field so a generic way of putting the non abelian gauge field is this the gauge field is a linear combination of the generators and the kind of uh, of course i will i will make the assumption that these uh, gauge fields are constants and for the kind of uh, gauge fields that are experimentally relevant this ai mu's will look like this what that means is that along the x direction you will have a sigma x coupling along the y direction you will have a sigma y and along the z direction you will have sigma z that's what it means so this gauge field is thought as an external field external fields absolutely they are static external yeah. fields yes just like uh, you know in the stern galdrack experiment you would think of the magnetic field gradient as an external object in which okay so what actually happens for these special fields is that the the hamiltonian actually the non interacting part of it actually reduces to a generalized spin orbit coupling problem of the rashba type so you actually get a problem like this so the gauge field is now determined by three numbers lambda x lambda y lambda z so the gauge field configuration or the spin orbit coupling space if you like is determined by these three vectors in the space okay 
all right so what are the kind of gauge fields we are interested in so before uh, before the experiments etc came we were thinking of this as the eigen vectors of uh, the the size of the eigen values of the lambda matrix so we just named them as prolate where it where the gauge field is only in one direction and then uh, there is a spherical gauge field where there is equal coupling in all directions there is a there is a uh, proposal for realizing this in experiments and there is the oblate gauge field where you have gauge coupling only in two directions and the other direction is free okay and uh, this, there is also a proposal for that okay so what are the one particle states of the system the one particle states momentum is of course a good quantum number and now the spin gets locked to the momentum so you can you can just sort of think of this as given a momentum there are two spin states one where the spin is parallel to the momentum that's the plus helicity state and the other where the spin is opposite to the momentum and that's the minus helicity state so if you look at the one particle dispersion the plus helicity state its minimum value no longer occurs at some k equal to 0 it occurs at a finite value of k which is proportional to the strength of this uh, phase diagram is this this is the inverse scattering length plotted on this exponentially small transition temperature and uh, transition temperature of the order tf on this side the question is what happens if i increase lambda that's the question i'm going to address okay all right so in as usual in cold atoms you start with two body problem because it's a dilute system so let's dis discuss what happens in the two body problem so let me start with the extreme prolate gauge field where there's gauge coupling only in one direction so nothing much changes there is a critical scattering length for forming a bound state and once you form a bound state and that critical scattering length is uh, the resonance scattering length once you form a bound state you have a binding energy of 1 over a scattering length square which is also well known but here's the first interesting thing what you actually see is that there is the spin is not a good quantum number in this the total spin is so actually what actually happens the bound state wave function has two pieces there's a singlet piece and a triplet piece and the triplet piece has a this curious property that its symmetry its spin nematicity is similar to that of the bw state of helium okay that's one one interesting thing okay now i go to the extreme oblate case where i have gauge coupling in two directions nothing in the third direction and here's the first surprise the critical scattering length to form the bound state in three dimensions vanishes what that means is any attractive interaction will now form a bound state for you in presence of this kind of spin orbit coupling okay and what you see is that for small negative scattering length it has a bcs like form and for small positive scattering length of course it's same as what was there for the small positive scattering length with some small corrections okay and here is another interesting part this bound state has again two pieces the singlet piece and the triplet piece and the triplet piece now has the nematicity of the abm state of helium 3 okay all right let me go to the spherical case and here this phenomena of forming bound states is even more accentuated and what you see is that there is again bound state for any scattering length and now we can actually solve this problem analytically v meaning jayant vyas nakari i mean not me okay and uh, and you actually find that you have an algebraically strong bound state there very very strong binding in three dimensions okay so this is the uh, main story okay so we can actually collect all this information and what you see is that if you look at this resonance value where the scattering length is infinity you see that the wave function has a has a very characteristic triplet content there is a singlet piece and a triplet piece because again it's mixing and there is a very characteristic triplet content and some binding energies like that and uh, the other point is uh, if i if i change the lambda along this line i can smoothly go from the uh, uniaxial nematic to the biaxial nematic for the for the uh, spin structure what about a generic gauge field somewhere somewhere along somewhere anywhere along this uh, uh, you know quarter space and what you see is that anywhere along there the scatter critical scattering length is negative what that means is said in english it's just this spin orbit coupling amplifies attractive interactions that's what that's the message okay why does this happen well we we'll, we can start by some slightly a uh, simple way of looking at it just look at the rg relevance of the rashba term at these fixed points and you will see that the rashba term is rg relevant at both places so you know that these fixed points are unstable so already you know something is going on okay but you can actually get a much better picture of this by looking at the density of states of the system now if you recall the, the plus helicity sheet had a whole bunch of states at low energy so actually what the spin orbit coupling does is it reorganizes the density of states of the system such that 
for the EP gauge field, when there is only gauge coupling in one direction, that's here in the lambda space, it's same as root E, same as what we had before. When I go to the EO gauge field, I see that the density of states is a constant. And when I go to the uh, uh, S gauge field, I see that the density of states looks like 1D problem. So what do you actually, what's, okay, what do you actually see is that the density of states is determined by the core dimension of the ground state manifold of the one body problem. So the ground, if I had EP gauge field, the ground state manifold is set of two points, core dimension is three, it's root E. If I have EO gauge field, the ground state manifold is a ring, core dimension is two, it is that. And if I had spherical gauge field, ground state manifold is a sphere, core dimension is one, and that's one over root E. This is all in the infrared. In the ultraviolet, it goes back to root E because the ultraviolet cannot see the spin orbit coupling any significantly. Okay? So now, if you believe this, you can actually get all the results by a simple uh, model. What you do is, you just construct a model where the density of states goes as some power law in the infrared and goes as square root e in the ultraviolet. And you can actually reproduce this entire story by just this simple density of states. So it is in this sense that the Rashba term is a relevant operator at these fixed points. It actually changes the density of states at these fixed points. As about, that's the story. Okay. So what happens if I have a finite density of fermions? And that's what I'm going to discuss now. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, you consider these symmetric cases, but should we take this to be more generic than that? Yes. It is, it is more generic than that because in, in, that's, what I, that's what you'll see. That's because even if you had a little bit of asymmetry, the finite density of fermions will actually wash off that asymmetry. You, it may get, yes, exactly. Okay, so now let's look at a finite density of fermions. I start with the density of fermions given by this scale, uh, Kf. So if you work out the problem, the non-interacting problem, no interactions now, you will see that the chemical potential varies like this for small lambda. What is small? Lambda much less than Kf. On the other hand, if I go to lambda much greater than Kf, the, the dependence of the chemical potential lambda, non-interacting case, changes qualitatively. You see, it goes as 1 over lambda to the 4. You know something is going on here. And what's going on here is quite curious, is that there is actually a change in the topology of the Fermi surface. In fact, I have a movie to show you how the topology changes. OK? So you can see I'm increasing lambda. Topology changes, and it comes back. Yeah, I can show it to you one more time. Actually, it's shown, shown upside down, but I think the Fermi surface is Fermi surface. OK, you can see that. So what happens here? I'm sorry, this is EO. This is for the EO case. The EO is lambda and lambda in two directions, nothing in the third direction. Okay? So what you have is two overlapping Fermi spheres at lambda equal to zero for plus and minus. And then what you see is that the Fermi sphere of the plus guys is larger and the minus guys is smaller. And at a particular lambda, lambda equal to lambda t, the plus guys completely take over. There are no minus guys. And if you go lambda greater than lambda t, it's all plus guys. And always, this lambda t is of order kf. Just from, that's the only scale in the problem. Okay? So that's what happens. Now I'm going to turn on interactions. I'm very excited because I believe that something is going to happen in this regime of lambda t. Because the Fermi surface topology is going to change. Okay? So here's, uh, the, uh, here's, what I'm, here's the setting. I'm going to take a small negative scattering length, which means I have very weak attractive interaction. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to fix the scattering length and change lambda. And so here is the result of the calculations. OK, let me not show you that. OK. So what you see is this is the chemical potential as a function of lambda. And for small lambda, lambda less than this lambda t, you see that the chemical potential follows essentially the non-interacting piece. The gap, the BCS gap, also follows exactly what we expect, and so on. But what happens when you cross this lambda equal to lambda t and go on the other side, larger values of lambda, you see that the chemical potential leaves the non-interacting line, the green line, and starts following the bound state energy of the two-body problem. This is a smoking gun signature of a BCS-BEC crossover. So it's actually crossing over to the BEC of something. Okay? And all this, of course, can be shown analytically. And the main message of this transparency is that this Rashba gauge field, spin orbit coupling, induces a BCS-BEC crossover at a fixed scattering length. There is no increase of attraction. You are not changing the, uh, the bare attractive interactions between the particles. All you're changing is there some kinetic energy, that's lambda, 
and that's what is causing this trans this uh, crossover. These are all mean free. I have I have we have, we have gone past mean free. Yeah, you will see. Okay. Okay. So crossover occurs in this regime. So what is the nature of this B C? So I've got a B C at large lambda. What kind of B C is that? Okay. Now what you see is something very interesting. You will see is that whatever scattering length you start off with, the chemical potential and the triplet content all go to the same value, irrespective of what the scattering length is. Okay. So what actually happens is B C for large lambda, much greater than lambda t, is independent of what scattering length you start off with, and the bosons to which these things are condensing to. It's a new kind of boson. We have given them a name. It's, we call them rush bonds because they are determined only by the gauge field, by the rush bar gauge field. So what is this rush bond? This rush bond is the bound bosonic state of two fermions in the presence of the gauge field when the scattering length is infinite. So what the system is doing is, as you increase lambda, it's, it's amplifying the attraction self-consistently to such a way that it just goes and tunes itself to have a resonant scattering length. So it is an attractive interaction amplification that's taking place. So what we have shown is that the gauge field induces a crossover from a BCS-like state, even with a small negative AS, to a Rashbon BEC state. Okay, what is the origin of the Rashbon? Uh, how much time do I have, Krish? Oh, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So there is a reason why these Rashbons come. Okay, I will not go into that. Let me quickly show you then, since I have only five minutes, I will quickly go through all the results. So one important thing that happens is, the main message let me go through is we have calculated the finite temperature calculation and let me show you the result of this phase diagram. The result of the phase diagram is I start off here, I'm increasing lambda, and here when I'm at large lambda, I go to the Rushbond BC. What is the transition temperature of the Rushbond BC? What's this? It is of the order TF with a scattering length which is one fourth of KFAS. So with a small negative scattering length, I can get a TC of order TF. So you can actually get a, 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 you can exponentially enhance the, the, the transition temperature of a, of a weakly uh, interacting BCS superfluid by using this trick. Yeah. Yeah. Lambda. Absolutely. That's why there is another dimensionless parameter. That's what gives you the rush bond. Yeah, but, but in that sense, you are just undoing this thing, which is strong coupling. Okay, right, 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 right. Actually, that strong coupling point that you're thinking about is actually described by weak coupling theory. We'll, we'll see it. We'll actually see it. I'll show you exactly what theory describes. You're asking what is the theory of the rush bond BC. I will, it's, it's coming. Okay, so let me skip all these things about rush bond dispersion. And Jayanth actually made this beautiful discovery that Although it, uh, the rush bonds are binding at small center of mass momenta, they are actually, the, the, the spin orbit coupling actually inhibits bound state formation at finite momenta. So actually what that means is that you will have actually have strong pseudo gap effects in this system. Okay. All right. So let me skip that. So this is the rush bond BC. This is related to your question. So we want to understand the properties of the rush bond BC. So we of course looked at uh, some theory. And then what you first see is that the superfluid density of this, the phase stiffness associated with this, is, as you increase lambda, is no longer determined by the density of the particles. It actually comes down and then goes up. So this must uh, put some red flags because we are taught that superfluid density of a continuum system is determined by the density. This is Galilean invariance, right? But here it is not. And the reason for this is that the system is not Galilean invariant because, as was pointed out by Professor Haridas, this is an external potential. Okay? So, uh, and this was actually pointed out by somebody else before us. And here's an extremely nice result, which is that if you take lambda equal to infinity, there's actually an emergent Galilean invariance. You can show irrespective of what the scattering length, the superfluid density at large lambda is determined by the density of particles and mass of these rush bonds. So there's an emergent Galilean invariance in the system. Okay? And uh, here's the answer to your question, uh, uh, Rajiv. So we have actually then asked, we asked the question, how do we describe this rush bond BEC? Can you describe it by a Boglubov theory? And then if the, if, the, if the Boglubov theory is determined by some weak interaction parameter, then I'm all set. Then I'm, my, my theory is good. Okay? And here's the answer. So we have looked at that. You just tap the superfluid a little bit. You l listen to the sound, and you can, you can figure out that it is actually a Boglubov theory. So that's what actually you see. And here's a beautiful result. 
So the rash bond BC is described by a Boglubov theory of anisotropic bosons whose scattering length is independent of the scattering length of the fermions and determined only by the spin orbit coupling. And as I send lambda to infinity, I have weakly interacting rash bonds. Okay, and that's what saves you. So it's an extremely beautiful state where the emergent excitations, their interactions, are not governed by the interactions of the constituents, but by some parameter that enters the kinetic energy. Okay. Okay, so I will also uh, tell you a couple of things about uh, experimental possibilities. Can I, that will be the last transparency of my, my talk. So just, okay. So, so here, this is an example of there are no interactions. How do I see the effect of a gauge field? Okay, one thing will happen is that the cloud that you have, suppose you, you have a non-interacting gas and you turn on lambda, what, you, what we can show is that the cloud will shrink. With no interactions, the cloud will shrink actually. And this is because of some pressure. The pressure is smaller because there are a lot of low energy states with zero velocity, so they don't actually transfer momentum to your container. So the cloud shrinks. That's one result. And here is another very interesting result, which may be actually useful for quantum computing, etc. So, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look start with this Hamiltonian, and I'm going to put a trapping potential omega naught, which, uh, as Krishnendu pointed out in his talk, has a the position can be represented in momentum in that way. And now what I do is I look at this uh, in some adiabatic limit where this trapping potential is much weaker compared to lambda. Then what I can do is I can write adiabatic wave functions like this, and I calculate, I calculate the effective Hamiltonian for that. And what you see is that the effective Hamiltonian for this adiabatic wave function is this. And now you see adiabatic motion in the presence of the gauge field in a potential generates a new gauge field for you. So what the gauge field does is it produces another gauge field for you. What's the use of this? Okay, here's the use of it. You take the spherical gauge field, equal coupling, and you can actually generate a monopole field in momentum space. And you also get this potential. The potential forces the particle to have a momentum P. So your particle will all, always have the momentum P. And you have this monopole field that comes in because you know the particle as it moves along picks up a very place. And that's what. So you can actually generate a monopole field in cold atoms with this. OK? OK, I, I should also emphasize that this can be actually used to probe. I, I mentioned about uh, probing problems. Uh, problems of probing the condensate, etc. This can actually also be used for that. We are working on those things. Okay, so there are some more recent developments, but but I have run out of time, so I will skip them, and I will just put out this set of transparencies which summarizes the work. Just give me one second, Krish. So two body problem will form a bound state for any scattering length. Many body will produce a many body result is that by tuning a gauge field, I can go to a new kind of BC called the Rashbon BC. And the Rushbond BC has high transient temperature. This gives us clues of using Rushbar like spin orbit coupling to produce high temperature superconductors, even if the attraction is weak. weak. There are some interesting new things like uh, uh, particles, emergent particles whose interactions are independent of the constituents. Uh, there are possibilities of generating novel Hamiltonians. I did not talk about this, but uh, there is also a possibility of flow enhanced pairing, which seems to violate Landau's principle that anything that flows will have lower pairing uh, 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 tendency. Uh, there is, we have studied Feshbach resonance in this, and this is the final picture. So, uh, Brijesh, the point is, if I have any, if I have any lambda, right, any, at, any attractive interaction, it will flow to this fixed point. So it's governed by this non-interacting Rushbond fixed point. That the physics is governed by that fixed point, actually, at large lambda. So if I have any A in the problem, non-zero, I'll flow there. Yeah. Okay, so that's the A. I had a, I had a commercial on other things we are doing. So it's work done by Amal. This is that uh, graphene ribbons are like... Uh, like uh, sensory organs, and they, they actually determine the magnetism of graphene nanoribbons. And we also have that uh, topological insulator ribbons goes uh, mod insulating in two different ways, synchronous and asynchronous. So if you're interested, please catch me afterwards. So let me put this back. Thank you.
can, can't you look at this physics just in uh, semiconductors where there's uh, strong spin orbit coupling, uh, Rashba spin orbit coupling, and, and I, I suppose uh, one could, uh, but and you can have attractive interaction just induced by phonons or something. I, I'm, I'm sure that can be done, but I, I have not explored it. It's something that we will be thinking about, uh, you know, how to transfer these ideas into real materials, something that we'll certainly be thinking about in the months to come. Uh, and second, can, can you give some intuition to this uh, high uh, TC that you get? Ah. Why spin orbit coupling makes TC higher? Okay. So, if I, if I, let's go back to the usual problem. The usual problem is that, you know, I, this is uh, minus 1 over KFAS, attractive interaction and this is TC. And here the TC is determined by, uh, is of order TF, actually point to TF, and here it is actually determined by the phase fluctuations of the tightly bound bosons. Mm -hmm. So what the system does is, if I put in lambda, even if I have, if the lambda is large, if I have, even if I have small layers, it actually forms a tightly bound pair. And it's the phase fluctuation, so these, they become bosons, and they condense, and it's the phase fluctuations of these guys who are, uh, which is governing the TC. And the mass of these effective bosons that form, that's what determines the TC. And by some very fortunate uh, happenstance, I don't exactly know why, the mass turns out to be like 2.3. Only slightly heavier than the mass of the, of the, uh, the usual boson formed out of two fermions. That's the answer. So the mass increases because of lambda? Le because of lambda. So it drags the gauge field along with it, correct? Yeah. Uh, is there a physical intuition as to why when you increase lambda, the crap becomes less and less important in the sense that there is a Galilean invariance? Uh, no, no, what is the question again? Sorry, uh, you said that there is an emergent Galilean invariance? Oh, that, no, 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 that is not in a trap, that is in the continuum. Ah, so that is in the continuum, of course. If I have a trap, of course I cannot have Galilean. Ah, okay. Even without a trap, if I have a gauge field, homogeneous gauge field, it is not Galilean. Instead of by 1 over KFAS, if I just scale AS with lambda or whatever is the dimensionless quantity coming out of that, uh, does this uh, look as just as a function of lambda, this yeah. parameter, does it look like ordinary BCS VEC crossover? No, it will go like this. It will, it will, if you fix lambda, so you are sort of thinking like this. Ah, okay. Yeah, it will look uh, yeah, along a cut l for a fixed lambda, it will look like BCS VEC crossover, yeah. No, no, I'm saying, say, along the lambda axis, and I measure, um, instead of, I fix my KF, and I measure it as a function of lambda, but not as a function of 1 over KFAS, but now I just talk about measure, that's exactly lambda the over A. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this curve and the rate curve roughly look similar. That's Absolutely, what, yeah. Okay. So the full theory, then, will have it out in another two, three weeks. Okay. Full theory, including phase pseudo gap. Yeah. Okay, so earlier you mentioned that, um, that you, you can get various kinds of helium type pairing, uh, the, the BW and the ABM states. It's not pure helium type, there is also an S wave piece. Right, but the question that I had was that since spin is not a good quantum number. It is so not a spontaneously broken symmetry here. In helium it is. Okay. Here, it, here the symmetry is picked out by what gauge field you put in. So it's, right. it's, it's, it's just a, it's just a, I'm, I'm just mentioning that as a, as an observation and not saying that, you know, there is a spontaneously broken symmetry. Right. Okay. There's one comment on that, and there's a is theory of unconventional superconductors, including this trans, which basically says the symmetry you pick would be determined by the um, kind of spin orbit couplings you're actually yeah. putting in. So it's basically that. Yeah. Uh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, just,